In this lesson, we continue to study the structure of the atom, specifically the electron. And the way we're going to do this is by studying light. You may be wondering, why are we studying light if we're studying the particles found in an atom? And the answer is simple. Electrons, as they're whizzing around the nucleus, behave in a similar way to light. And so, we're going to learn more about electrons by understanding light. So let's talk about light. Light has two components, or two parts. It has an electrical part, this disturbance in the electrical force with high regions and low regions of a wave. Traveling at the same time is a magnetic disturbance. This magnetic wave also has peaks and valleys as it travels through space. And if you put these two components together at right angles to each other, you'll end up with a light wave, also known as electromagnetic radiation. We also describe light as having two natures, two behaviors. One way to think of light is to think of it as a particle called a photon. In some cases, this is a great model. It's a great construct to see how light behaves. Another way we think of light is to consider it as a wave. A wave is something that carries energy from one place to another. So light has two natures, two ways that it behaves. And really, you could think of light as kind of being both. So let's break down a wave and talk about some of its characteristics. Remember, a wave carries energy from one place to another. So let's imagine this wave is moving from left to right across our screen. The top part of the wave is known as the crest, and you'll see these crests repeated over and over again, while the bottom of the wave is known as the trough. If you looked at the distance between two of those troughs, or two of those crests, or really two places that are moving in the same way anywhere along this wave, they're all the same distance, and that distance is known as the wave's length, or wavelength. It's the distance between two successive waves. Since it is a length, it is measured in meters. Many times, the kind of light that we're going to talk about will have wavelengths very, very tiny. And so, instead of measuring in meters, or even millimeters, we'll make our measurements in micrometers, millionths of a meter, or even in nanometers, which is a billionth of a meter. The next component has to do with this moving wave, and you have to imagine that you're standing at a point along the wave, watching waves go by. And if you were to count how many waves went by in a matter of time, you would get what is known as the frequency. Frequency is a measure that tells how frequently waves pass. Frequency will be measured then in the waves that go by per second, or sometimes we just simplify that to per second. Or there's another unit we use for that called the Hertz, abbreviated HZ. The last measurement we don't use as often in our calculations, and that is a measurement that tells how tall the wave is. That measurement is known as the amplitude or the height of a wave. If this were a sound wave we were talking about, the height would tell us how loud that sound wave was. And if it were a light wave, as we're studying, the height would tell us how bright the wave is. I do want to point out a couple weird symbols here. Notice that the symbol for wavelength is not a symbol we typically write in the English language. That is a Greek symbol. The symbol is called lambda, and it does look a little like an upside down Y. I also want to point out to you the symbol for frequency which looks like a V, but it's also a Greek symbol. It's the Greek symbol nu, and it's a minor distinction, but you'll notice that as you're working through uh, various calculations using these symbols. The last thing that I would like to point out to you is that there are a variety of waves. We're talking about electromagnetic radiation, and some of that has a really long wavelength, maybe a meter, or 10 meters, or even longer. And some of this light wave has very tiny waves. We're talking like millionths or even billionths of a meter. So let's start with the longest waves. The longest waves are known as radio waves, 
And as you already know, these waves are used oftentimes to carry information. We've found ways to modulate or to change these waves. And we can either modulate or change their frequency or their amplitude to create FM or AM radio signals. These waves are very harmless. In fact, radio waves travel through the room where you're sitting right now, and we have little concern for them. We'll probably never even know that they're there unless we have some way to tune into those waves. The next waves are a little bit shorter than these, and that's probably where they got their name from. They're called microwaves, although when you look at the complete spectrum, you'll notice they're not small compared to most of the different electromagnetic radiation. Microwaves, as you're aware, can be used to heat water if they're the right size. There are a lot of microwaves that don't necessarily excite water molecules, and those are often also used to carry information. You may have seen a TV van show up to do a remote broadcast and raise an antenna. Oftentimes, those TV stations are broadcasting microwave radiation back to their studios. The next part of the spectrum is known as infrared radiation. And these kinds of light waves are a little too long for our eyes to see. Infrared radiation is just before the red part of the light we can see, and that's where it gets its name. Infrared light is often used in remote controls. So when you push a button on your TV remote, it sends out a specific frequency beam of electromagnetic radiation that's picked up by your TV. Infrared radiation also carries heat, and you sometimes see infrared lights used in buffet lines or at fast food restaurants. We can't detect infrared radiation, but there are some animals that sense that and can tell when there's another warm body nearby. We can sense infrared heat using special night vision goggles, as the military has been doing for a long time. This brings us to the next part of our spectrum, known as visible light. Visible light is the only part of the electromagnetic spectrum that our eyes can detect unaided. We see the different kinds of light depending on the energy it carries to our retinas in our eyes. Some of the waves are longer, and they're known as red light. Some are kind of in between, like yellow and green light. And then the shortest of the light waves we can see would produce blue or violet light. Just beyond the violet portion of the spectrum is a region known as ultraviolet, or beyond violet. Ultraviolet radiation have shorter waves than visible light, and thus we can't see these either. These light waves carry more energy than visible light and are able to penetrate through at least a few layers of our skin. As you're probably aware, too much of this kind of radiation damages the DNA in your skin cells and can cause problems like melanoma or skin cancer. The next part of the spectrum is made of light waves even shorter than ultraviolet radiation. Light waves known as X-rays. These carry a tremendous amount of energy and are able to penetrate through just about any tissue in a living body. The only tissues that X-rays don't penetrate is your bone, and thus doctors can create images of those so that they can diagnose problems. The last part of the electromagnetic spectrum are the shortest of the waves. These are called gamma rays, and they carry the most energy and thus are the most dangerous of all the different types of electromagnetic radiation. These waves are often emitted when the nucleus of an atom undergoes radioactive decay. So this is a quick overview of light, some of the details about it. We're going to continue to study light waves in the next section and learn more about calculating the wavelengths and the frequencies from the speed of light. I hope this gives you a better overview of light and why we study it in chemistry.